the educator.com's SAT course. Today we're going to talk about meeting the SAT, just what's a basic introduction to the SAT. Our legal disclaimer, test names are the registered trademarks of the respective owners. Said owners are not affiliated with educator.com. The College Board was not involved in the production of and does not endorse this course. What is the SAT? So the SAT is a standardized test used in college admissions. It is published and administered by a company called the College Board. Most students planning to apply to college take the test, and the colleges they apply to use their scores as a factor in the decision process. For some colleges and universities, it's going to be a more important factor. For other ones, it will be less important. But any place that's accepting it has some interest in how those scores are. Why do you care? Well, how well you do on the SAT affects which colleges will accept your application. Why do you care which colleges accept you? Well, college can be a pretty amazing time, and you probably want to have some control over which one you go to. You want the colleges that you're most interested in going to to accept you so you can go there, right? So if you want to be able to have a lot of choice in which college you can get to, uh, you want to be able to do well on the SAT. So doing well on the SAT can really help you get into the colleges you're most interested in going into. And why do you care about going to a college that you really like? Because college can be great, and if you don't believe me on that yet, just trust me, you're going to probably really enjoy being at college when you're there, so you want to have some control over which one you go to. What about those other tests? So you mean tests like the PSAT, also known as the PSAT, NMSQT, SAT subject test, aka the SAT2, or the ACT? Man, that's a lot of acronyms. Yeah, okay, so there are a lot of other standardized tests out there, and we're going to talk about those in the next section, and standardized tests in general. Right now, though, we're focusing on understanding what makes up the SAT in specific. So if you really want to have a better understanding of these specific tests, or maybe some other standardized tests, check out the next lesson where we'll talk more about those other tests. But right now, we're going to talk about the SAT specifically and understand what we're up against with it. How is the SAT made up? The SAT is broken up into 10 different testing chunks. We're going to call each of these chunks a section. That's the name for one of these testing chunks. There'll be some brief period of time, generally 25 minutes, that you'll have to work on a section. Each section belongs to one of three different categories. Writing, critical reading, and mathematics. And confusingly enough, the categories are also called sections. So you might talk about the writing section, where you will do one writing section, but there are other writing sections within the writing section. It's sort of confusing. We use the word section to talk about the category, but we also use the word section to talk about the discrete testing chunk. It will be obvious which one we're talking about when it's in context, but it is a little weird that we use the sec word section for both category and the test chunk. That's how it is though. The writing category is special. So writing section has one special unique section inside of it, the essay. And we'll talk more about the essay later. The sections are timed in minutes as follows. Writing has 25 minutes for the essay and then a 25 minute and a 10 minute. Critical reading has a 25 minute, a 25 minute, and a 20 minute. And then mathematics is the same as critical reading. So in total, that's going to be 60 minutes on writing and then 70 minutes on both critical reading and mathematics. Now, if you're really sharp and we're paying a lot of attention, you might go, hey, wait, you said there were a total of 10 seconds, sections, but I only see nine up there. What's going on? Yeah, you caught me. You're right. There's nine sections here, but you'll actually have 10 sections on the test. So what's going on is the experimental section. It's also called sometimes the variable section. The experimental section is an extra 25 minute section. It can be from any of the three categories. It could be a writing section, it could be a critical reading section, it could be a math section. It's gonna look just like a normal section, but it has no effect on your score. So unlike all of the other sections, how you do on it doesn't matter. Do not try to skip this section. Do not think that you can figure out which one is the experimental section and be like, ah, great, time for a 25 minute nap. If you do that, there's a very good chance that you're going to have gotten it wrong, right? The section that is the fake section, that's the experimental section, it looks like just the other, just like the other sections. So if you try to figure out which one's fake and you're wrong, you know what just happened? You ruined a perfectly good SAT score. So you've got no choice when you're up against the experimental section, even if you're 99% sure it has to be the experimental section, and I have no idea how you could be that sure because it looks just like the other ones, you still want to work on it as if you're doing a normal section because 
if you were to get it wrong, it would be catastrophic for your grade. So just work on all the sections with all the skills and all the ability, try as hard on each of them, do the best you can, even if you have an inkling that it might be not a real section. Why is the experimental section there? The College Board uses it to test out new questions, compare responses in different tests, and generally just do experimentation and research. They're, you know, you're paying to be a guinea pig for them, but hey, what are you going to do? Order of the sections. For the most part, the order that the sections come in is random, but there are a few things you can rely on. The first section is always the essay. That's always going to be the case. You'll always start off with an essay when you're taking the SAT. Also, the eighth and ninth sections are going to be critical reading and mathematics. You don't know what the order is going to be, but you do know that they're going to be shorter than normal. They're going to wind up being 20 minutes long. And finally, the last section, the tenth section, is always going to be the short 10-minute writing section. If we were to turn it into a picture, then we would start off with essay, at the very beginning, weighing in at 25 minutes. At the end, we will wind up having critical reading and math. Not sure what the order is, but we do know they'll each be 20 minutes. And at the very, very end, we'll have a writing section at 10 minutes. And all the stuff in the middle, that is what you don't know the order of. So random order. That's going to be where the bulk of the test will show up, and you don't really have any idea of how it's going to be ordered in there, but don't really worry about it too much. You just want to do the best you can on every section as you see it. Scoring the SAT. How do they turn how you do on it into that 800-point score, which becomes that 2,400-point score when they add all three of them up? So before we can talk about that, we have to talk about the idea of raw score. So with the exception of the essay, it works like this. A correct answer gives you plus one point to your raw score. If you omit an answer, which means you put nothing down, you get nothing. That seems perfectly reasonable. If you get a wrong answer on a multiple choice, wrong multiple choice gets you minus a fourth, but a wrong answer on a free response gets you nothing, has no effect. So wrong answer on a free response doesn't hurt, but wrong answer on a multiple choice, and multiple choice questions make up the vast majority of the SAT, loses you a quarter of a point. Now, really briefly, let's take a quick tangent and understand why is that the case. Well, remember, you could guess, right? Since all of the all the questions always come as five choices, A, B, C, D, and E. So that means if you guessed, you would have a one in five chance of getting it right, right? Since you have a one in five chance of getting it right whenever you guess, then if they didn't account for that, you'd be able to get points not knowing anything just by randomly guessing. So that they've got this, this is why they've got that wrong answer thing, minus a quarter. Because that way, when you randomly guess, one-fifth of the time, you'll get one point. So imagine you guess on five questions. So five questions, just completely guessing, totally random. Then on average, if you guessed five times, you're going to get one question right, and you're going to also get four questions wrong. And since each question is minus a quarter, that's going to be a total of zero points added. So this multiple choice taking off points when you get it wrong, the point of that isn't so much to penalize you, to hurt you. The point of that is to make it so that there's no benefit to guessing. So that random guessing, uneducated guessing, doesn't increase your score. So once you've got all of your numbers, once you figure out how you did on each question, if you got it right, you got it wrong, what type of question it was, you total them all up and you've got your raw score for that category. So you total them all up for all of the math questions, and then you've got that math category, that math section score, and so on for all the other ones as well. The essay is a little bit weird. That one has two graders will independently read your essay, and each will give it a score from 1 to 6. Then those are added together, and that gives you an essay score from 2 to 12. The 800-point scale. How do we get from this raw score to the 800-point scale that we know so well and think of, you know, I want the 2400? The College Board goes through this process called equating. Now, 
your version of the test is going to be different than the test someone took last year, and the year before that, and the year before that, and also the test that someone will take next year. So what they do is they're going to adjust the score of your SAT based on its relative difficulty compared to other ones, and also different test versions. So they're going to make it so that your test specifically sort of connects to the broader tests that everyone has taken. From one year to the next, the same raw score might give different values on the 800 point scale, but we're talking very slight variations. If you wind up getting a 50 raw point score, it might be plus 10 or minus 10 from one year to the next, but for the most part, it's going to wind up being pretty much the same thing. So don't worry about how it changes from year to year. Mainly, you've got a sense of how it is based on your raw score. Then they take your raw score and they think in terms of this equating and they're going to apply the scores to a bell curve. It's not an exact bell curve, but it's pretty close. So we'll use it for our purposes. What's a bell curve? A bell curve is a curve that looks kind of like a bell, right? That's not a perfect bell, kind of lumpy, but in the middle of it, that's where the average person will lie. Now, as you get farther and farther up along it, it gets harder and harder to have gotten in it. So it's going to thin out to practically nothing as you get farther and farther. So an average score, most people will wind up getting a score of 500. That's the average score. And then fewer will have 600, but even fewer will have 700, and practically no one will have 800. So we've got less and less common scores as you go farther and farther up because fewer people manage to reach those scores. That's how the bell curve works, and the same thing in reverse. It's harder, in a way, to achieve a 200. Fewer people get 200, then get 300, then get 400, then get 500. It's not an exact bell curve. There's a slight shifting, but it's really, really close to a bell curve, so that's a good way to understand it. There's also the word percentile that you'll hear show up, and what that means is the word percentile is a way to compare your score to everyone else's score. The word percentile will pop up when you look at your score report. It's a measure of how well you did compared to others. A score in the 80th percentile means that it's higher than 80% of the other scores. A score in the 47th percentile is higher than 47% of the other scores. So it's just a way of saying how much better you did than everybody else. What's your score in comparison to the rest of the group? If you want to take the SAT, you have to register for it. You can register online at sat.collegeboard.org. Go there, start looking through the site. It'll be really easy to find how to register and set up your test date so you can go be ready to take the test down the road. Remember, you have to register well in advance of the test you'll be taking, so don't put this off. It is possible to have a late registration, but that'll put stress on you and extra added cost, so just do this well in advance of when you're going to be taking the test. You also need to make sure you have time to send the scores to colleges, so it's generally better to take it earlier than later, right? You don't want to have to rush your scores to colleges, because once again, that's going to add stress and add cost, so you want to take it earlier than later, so you'll have plenty of time to send your scores into colleges. Also, you can retake the SAT and study more if you're unhappy with the score, but once again, you need to be careful about this registration process. If you let that registration process keep past you, you know, deadlines can be deadly. Make sure you've registered for the test you want to take, but if it goes badly, you can always register for one down the road and take another one that hopefully you'll be more happy with. All right, hope that gives you a pretty good understanding of how the SAT works, how scoring is connected, and now we're going to start talking about a whole bunch of other stuff connected to the SAT. We'll see you later at educator.com.